Thank you. I hope you can hear me and there should be a presentation coming up and I need the remote control if possible. In the back. In the back? Ah, perfect. Wow. Perfect. Fantastic. So, just a quick thank you. I really appreciate the invitation today. Um, as uh, was already said, I will focus on the exclusively on the transnational threats. So let me just see if I can actually work this. OK. Ah. OK, good, perfect. That's what I wanted to know. Perfect. Um, on the transnational threats uh, that the Houthi movement pose. So I'm not going to look an introspection of what the Houthis mean for Yemen or even for the conflict, but what the Houthis mean for regional or international stability. Uh, in order to explain where I'm coming from and why this is a particular emphasis of my presentation, just a few words about the organization that I'm primarily working for, the, the Counter Extremism Project. We are a transatlantic, uh, privately funded think tank and advocacy organization that looks at a broad range of ideologically motivated violence, so all the way from right-wing extremism to Islamist terrorism, preferably in a transnational sense. And we work with governments in North America and Europe on the development and implementation of effective counterterrorism measures that includes regulations and, of course, legal changes. Since 2019, we have a separate legal entity here in Berlin and a, a permanent office in Berlin, in addition to our offices in New York and London. And we have people working for us, as you would imagine, in Washington, in Brussels, in Dublin, in Paris, and in Bratislava for Central and Eastern Europe. Um, my presentation will make six quick points today. I will do a quick SWOT analysis, which has obviously no uh, claim to completeness. Then I'll look at the missile and drone capabilities of the Houthis, the Houthis' relationship with Iran, who was already mentioned, the threat to international shipping, smuggling and sanctions evasion, and risks due to their extremist ideology that remain if everything else goes well or not so well. So let me start with a SWOT analysis. As I said, this is not claiming any kind of completeness here, but of course it demonstrates that the Houthi movement, despite its current concentration on the domestic conflict and the fight with the coalition in and around Yemen, um, is both a regional as well as a, trans a transnational threat. Um, what you can see here, the strengths, uh, just put a couple of points together, of course they have been fighting for quite a while, not only just 2015, we've heard already there were several you know, fights with uh, President Saleh beforehand. They have very firm external support from Iran and Hezbollah, and I'll get to that in my presentation. Um, they have established re regional smuggling networks that go beyond just the vicinity of, of Yemen. Um, they have a couple of weaknesses, of course. The economic conditions in Yemen remain extremely challenging, to say the least. Um, that uh, slows down their development of a domestic manufacture capability in particular for longer strike capabilities, i.e. Uh, missiles and uh, 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 drones. But uh, you know the, the, these capabilities are being developed. Um, the Iranian support is really limited uh, to what Iran could be doing, uh, not only because of the international sanctions against Iran, but also, and I'll explain that in a little bit detail when we get to that point, um, because it sees the Houthis very differently from the way it sees Hezbollah as a patron-client relationship, not a full proxy yet. And of course, the United Nations Security Council, as well as bilateral sanctions, can disrupt the supply operations if they're implemented uh, uh, diligently. The opportunities, of course, is that they are holding a strategic location in Yemen, um, especially when it comes to international shipping, which means they have the ability to disrupt it quite effectively. They have the ability and demonstrated ability to target not only Saudi Arabia, but now only uh, also the UAE oil facilities, of course, um, which in the particular situation that we find ourselves now with strained international energy prices is a major concern. And of course, the opportunities they have is that the lack of transparency in the regional financial system, beneficial ownership, um, funds being set up, um, lack of control of the charitable sector within the region, um, enables their smuggling operations as well as the money laundering operations. The threats they pose is that, of course, at the moment, they focus on the conflict, but that may not necessarily remain that way, even especially if the conflict somehow gets resolved. Um, they are very clearly, and continue to state this, as my previous speaker said, opposed to anything that has to do with the US, with the West, or with Israel. And um, at the moment, unfortunately, um, a major threat is that any 
further disruptions to the flow of oil from the Gulf to international markets will spike prices quite, quite effectively. So let me have a look at the missile and drone capabilities. And please uh, bear with me. I'm not a missile and drone specialist. But um, what we can see here, um, that uh, they have a whole bunch of range. And you can get very detailed information on this um, uh, in, the, in the literature about the Houthi movements. Um, they, these strong drone and missile capabilities have been at the center of the threat debate with the Houthis. But um, currently, two basic assessments, in our opinion, my the Counter Extremism Project, remain, of course, true. Number one, um, the Houthis continue to depend on Iranian supply of spare parts. They are, however, developing an indigenous capability, which means the balance is going to shift. Um, secondly, um, of course, the Houthis have been using these capabilities for cross-border attacks in Saudi Arabia, and there's, as far as we can see, more than 700 of those uh, since 2015, um, both attacks and attempted attacks. Um, but that picture is also changing now. And, and by the way, here's just a summary of what they were hitting until last year. And you can see the ranges are getting quite impressively large now, even to the north of Saudi Arabia, which means the UAE is actually not so much of a challenge. So this was before the recent attacks on, on the UAE. So the range is going to uh, become a real problem. Um, now, attempts to strike beyond Saudi Arabia. Of course, the big game changer and the really ironic game changer in January this year was when they started not only to target um, uh, civilian facilities near the airport in Abu Dhabi, but also a US military installation by design or default is not quite clear, but they did. That's where the stuff went down. That means uh, this is the civilian facility, and that's the drone that the Americans shot down on their facility, which means that broadening their, uh, um, their uh, portfolio of targets. Now, targeting an active airport in Abu Dhabi is not as big as Dubai, but it's not a small airport. Um, given the imposition of their long strike capabilities, um, does look deep into what kind of potential collateral da damage the Houthi movements may have been willing to accept if they had hit the runway rather than the storage facilities just a couple of hundred meters to the side while an airplane was talking, uh, uh, taking off. I think we would still be in great detail um, talking about the Houthi strikes uh, at the airport at this point. So it is really going to get a little bit uh, uh, more tricky. Uh, and the sole irony, of course, is that um, this strike happened after really the UAE had more or less effectively disengaged, at least on the ground, from the conflict in Yemen in 2019 and 20. Yes, of course, there is still some support. And yes, of course, there's arguments being made that this was all due to the Giants Brigade making some military gains in Shabwa and, and Marib. But um, I cannot help to think about the timing of the attack in the regional uh, scenario, and um, this being potentially not completely motivated by inherent domestic um, uh, consideration by the Houthi movements. Um, because what we'd seen in 2019 is that Iran, and this is the oil facility in Saudi Arabia that was hit with the main impact sites, right? Um, Iran was very willing to let the Houthis claim an attack for which the Houthis really only were at best partially responsible. And this is the analysis of where the launch sites may have been in Iran, um, because clearly the rockets came from the wrong directions for it to be the Houthis. But the existing capability of the Houthis, that they have this strike ability, that they have verifiably been attacking Saudi Arabian infrastructure, enables, of course, Iran to at least produce some cover in a good Russian sense. The more stories of what could have happened you put out, the more of the wrong stories are going to stick and the less believable the actual story is going to be. So for Iranian disinformation campaigns, for their own purposes, the Houthis' capabilities provide a perfect cover. Um, and this is only going to get more relevant if you look at the current situation. As you may have all heard, there was an IRGC colonel who somehow mysteriously fell dead in Tehran a couple of days ago, followed by a drone attack on a Parchin missile site. So clearly, we are now again in an upward stick of regional tensions between Israel and Iran. And uh, 
Israelis already are, uh, um, like yesterday or the day before yesterday, warning its citizens to leave Turkey because of potential Iranian retaliation. This scenario is, of course, very thinkable if this uh, um, escalation continues. And that's why it's really good to look at the relationship between the Houthis and Iran a little bit in more detail. Now, when I served in Iran, and I was at the German embassy between 2006 and 2011, uh, sorry, 2005 and 2011, um, the Houthis truly were an afterthought for the Iranian strategic thinking. Um, yes, there was some support provided, um, but it's nowhere even close to the relationship with Hezbollah, where Iran was, from its very generation of the group, involved in uh, organizing Hezbollah, in providing the major funds to Hezbollah, in providing arms to Hezbollah. This really wasn't on the same level with the Houthi movement. There was some logistical support, some money that came. But in 2015, that changed. And that not, didn't change because some ideological awakening in the Islamic Republic, but while Iran rarely is strong enough or has enough resources to affect the, re the regional situation, it is very adept of taking advantage of developing regional situations. So the major regional, uh, uh, regional competitor of Iran, Saudi Arabia, invading Yemen for really no good apparent purpose um, pro provided the opportunity that this picture then in 2019 is shot. And let me tell you, the supreme leader doesn't meet just anyone. This is the spokesperson, not even the head of the Houthi Muslim, the spokesperson, um, you, who you all know, Mohammed Abdul Salam, right? Um, meeting someone senior but not the top of the Houthi movement is, of course, a, a strong political signal where Iran sees this relationship. But as I said, it's not yet a full proxy. It receives material and support in training from Iran, of course, indirectly also receives support and training from Hezbollah, which means this is another way that Iran can um, develop its uh, relationship. And of course, the Houthi move states itself that it sees itself as part of the axis of resistance. The threat, what this means, the relationship to Iran, of course, is number one, Yemen is currently the perfect testing ground for Iranian Hezbollah weaponry, whether it's UAEs or missiles or drones, um, whether it's uh, uh, un, uh, uh, IEDs um, or other weaponry that Iran wants to change, uh, wants to test, or Hezbollah wants to test whether it works. Um, then, of course, uh, that was one too far. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction here. How do I go back? Doesn't seem to go back. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, there you go. Sorry for that one. Chaotic. Um, and uh, the big question that I mentioned already is when the regional situation escalates, and it really unfortunately looks like it will, because um, with uh, the current situation in Vienna with the JCPOA talks, it doesn't really look like the last remaining issue, the removing of the IIGC from the foreign terrorist organization list, is going to happen if it, it was unlikely uh, politically in any case, and it's now, um, with the current situation, practically impossible, um, then we will see an escalation of tensions. And that also means that we need to look a little bit more on the threat to international shipping proposed, uh, proposed by the Houthis. Um, first of all, um, regular attacks, of course, occur constantly on Saudi vessels, both at sea and in the ports in Saudi Arabia. Um, the Houthi territory, as you all know, is very conveniently located, very close to, uh, uh, to Bab al-Mandeb, um, which is one of the most significant economic shipping routes. Uh, and that means if they start to disrupting this, um, then we are in major trouble. If you just remember a couple of weeks of a ship stuck in the Suez Canal in 2021, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why we have the supply chain issues that we face today. And the, um, the Band, uh, Bab al Mandeb and the Gulf of Aden is already a quite hot shipping area. These are um, 2010 to 2021 hostile shipping incidents. Not this is beyond Houthis, this is also piracy, but it just shows you how difficult it is to get your container ship through this without getting attacked or hijacked or, atta uh, or in any way bothered. So these are just hostile shipping incidents. Now, what this also means is that when we go back to the relationship with Iran, we do now have Iran um, potentially having the ability to disrupt two choke points. So not just the Strait of Hormuz 
and the Arabian Sea, but also here, the entrance and exit of the Red Sea. As I said, uh, all has to be seen in light of the region confrontation and the relation, developing relationship between the Houthis and Iran. So uh, what I would say is to all who say that um, uh, the Houthis are already a full proxy like Hezbollah, let's really pray that they're not, because otherwise Hezbollah would close that strait um, if, if they would be in a, in a position and Iran would ask. Smuggling and sanctions evasion, this is a little bit of a complicated technical issue. So the regional system is already, of course, um, burdened with quite a few <laughs> compliance issues. So we still have ISIL money and investments that were done uh, between 2014 and 2019, when, as, the, as you all know, famously controlled large swathes of territories and made literally hundreds of millions in profits, not just in turnover, not almost billions, but in profits, and invested in the region. That money, uh, about 100 million, are still somewhat lost. Secondly, um, you have now even greater problems with Taliban finances, including from the international truck trade, because the Taliban just taken over Afghanistan and its entire economy, which means they no longer have to set up specific money laundering operations. They now have the entire uh, Afghan uh, uh, economy to do so, including its reach into Dubai. So that's another one. And then, of course, we have constant attempts by Iran to evade its sanctions and a newly a proclaimed cooperation between Iran and Russia in sanctions evasions in the region. So it's not like the compliance offices in banks and the regional financial system had nothing to do. Now on top of all of this, we have the, uh, um, uh, the support that is channeled via illicit uh, channels financially to the Houthis and the Houthis have established uh, a network to evade sanctions, which means we do have a real, wow, this is now going completely wild. Okay. Um, it was the second from the last slide. So, um, so we now have, um, of course, heightened uh, 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 problems with money laundering and financial crime. Um, the Houthis operate in the region that is characterized by various challenges to financial transparency. So if you want to know who owns a company in uh, the UAE, um, good luck if you're in a free trade zone, because this is not data that is publicly available. Ah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Let me see if, yeah, it actually goes back. Perfect. OK. Shipping we had. I'm so sorry for this. This, this is when you design your slides too complicated. I should stop by that. So what is really uh, interesting and I think really s uh, significant is that at least the US has started to target these financial networks. And so in 2021 did the UN. Um, as the previous speaker had already mentioned, these kind of targeted sanctions that do not obsess about an organization putting them on the foreign terrorist organization list, which basically closes, this is the sledgehammer version of sanctions, um, which basically closes the doors, including to a wide extent to humanitarian relief operations, or at least makes them extremely more difficult. Um, target the individual networks, target the individuals who run those networks, who are actually far more affected by these sanctions than any organization being on an FTO list ever does. Because these financial facilitators do need to travel international. They do need to have control over bank accounts. And through targeted sanctions, you take that ability away. So final point, um, even if all would go fantastically well, um, there is still a bit of a problem with the ideology, as the previous speaker already mentioned, not only domestically, but I would argue also transnationally. Right? So luckily for everyone involved, currently they focus on the domestic conflict and the fight against the coalition. However, they are part of the axis of the resistance, and I've been droning out about them acting on behalf of Iran. But the, uh, the movement is also ideologically opposed to the West, the US, and Israel, as demonstrated by frequent US hostage taking and the killing in 2015 of John Hammond, a contractor they thought was an American spy, or in November 2021, the storming of the US embassy in Aden, where they took some Yemeni employees as hostages. So it's not as if the Houthis would be just opposed to Saudi Arabia. They are opposed to Western interests who are very close in that region. Therefore, I would argue that the threat increases A, if the regional situation escalates and mm, Iran starts to mobilize, mobilize all its clients to hit back against the US, against Europe, against Israel, whoever is on the target list right now, there are 
a couple of Greek tankers who are now in Iranian custody since a couple of days ago. So uh, you know, Iran is able to mobilize its clients. And unfortunately, ironically, if the pressure of the domestic conflict subsides due to some form of a settlement in Houthis, um, there will be a phase where it will become clear on how much this ideological ideology actually then dictates their actions. Because if the energy is no longer diverted against domestic opponents or against the coalition, then we will have to see whether death to Israel or death to the Americans actually means something to the Houthi movement or not. I would say this is not a chance we should take lightly. And of course, I've argued for targeted sanctions, but if it is possible, and I would argue it is, to really significantly disrupt the smuggling and the supply networks, especially when focusing on the financial aspects of this, which are more or less uh, um, you know, part of the international financial system, which via the FATF and the Egmont Group and, and other organizations you have some kind of control over, uh, even remotely, and then of course you would have to ask, uh, expect some retaliatory action. Therefore, in summary, my threat assessment, right? So, missile in UV. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, missile in UAE capabilities developed, um, including domestic manufacture. Cross border attacks now go beyond Saudi Arabia to the UAE, and I don't think this is going to stop. Um, the uh, capabilities have in the past, and I would argue will in the future again act as a cover for Iranian operations. The relationship with Iran is a patron client, but the Houthis have clearly stated several times that they feel themselves to be part of the axis of the resistance, and we will have to see in a potential regional conflict on what side they will fall and how much they are willing to do the bidding of Iran. The movement has demonstrated that it's a threat to international shipping by several, uh, quite a large number of attacks on Saudi vessels. It has access to the strategic waterway that is the entry or exit of the Red Sea. Um, the smuggling and sanctions evasions threatens the integrity of the region, international system, f f uh, regional financial system, and I would say to a certain extent also the international financial system. And extremist ideology presents a threat to the West, Israeli, or US interests. And therefore, we should have a close look on this movement um, going forward. Thank you so much. That concludes my presentation. I'm sorry for the technical hiccups. Excellent. And uh, the benefit uh, of a concise presentation is now we have good time for questions and uh, comments and discussion. Bear with me one second. So as always, please raise your hand, uh, and then we will bring you the microphone. Who would like to go first? Questions, comments, please. Okay. And please introduce yourself as well. Uh, Khaled Al Afif, uh, German Yemen Forum for Rights and Liberties uh, in Berlin. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comments uh, are in uh, you mentioned the strength of the Houthis, hmm. uh, and you mentioned uh, it was a uh, riot, but uh, I do think it's also there is a, one important uh, factor who make Houthis strength: the weakness of their uh, of the other uh, parties of the other uh, Yemeni. Parts and all the uh, uh, Arab uh, alliance parties. Uh, they are different agendas. Hmm. UAE, uh, UAE has a, another agenda in Yemen, and Saudi Arabia, we don't know what's their agenda in Yemen. <laughs> at, at the beginning, it was supporting the Yemeni uh, legitimate government, and now we don't know. Uh, the other, uh, also my, my, my question, also other question, you mentioned the, the, uh, the uh, national or the regional uh, fa uh, factors in Yemen, and you mentioned what's the uh, role of Qatar and Oman. Right. They play uh, a big <coughs> role also in Yemeni no, of course. hopeless war. Uh, about the weapons smuggling, uh, smuggling. Uh, Iran is supported with the weapons since many years or long years. And in 2013, it was uh, two ships. The Yemeni government detected in the Yemen borders, Jihan 1 and Jihan 2, yeah. I do think so, full with weapons. But now, all ways to Yemen are closed by USA and Arab alliance. And the Yemeni factors so always. Uh, always. <laughs> uh, we, 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 I understand from that, the, that all is all a borders, all, all borders, sea uh, and the flight, yes. all, all Weapons how, penetrate how, any blockade. But we, we, don't, we don't talk about uh, small weapons. We, don't, we talk about uh, uh, muscle. We, we, don't, we talk about uh, technology. Things. Yeah, but they never actually. Oh, sorry, okay. I, Sorry. I, I, I will finish and then you, you can uh, uh, answer. Uh, okay. And the other one, uh, why USA withdraw uh, the, the Patriot? 
uh, uh, USA yeah. withdrew the patriots uh, uh, from uh, patriots. To, uh, to, uh, or withdrew to, to defend their, their alliance in, in, in the region. Yeah, that's what that's the question. Thank you. Okay, well, that's quite a lot of questions. So, yes, I asked. Um, so the strength, yes, absolutely, I agree with you, right? That uh, one strength is also the weaknesses, but in a SWOT analysis, that would be in the category of opportunities, right? So the opportunity is that your that your opponents are um, are uh, uh, weak. Uh, on the on the the policy of Saudi Arabia, I agree. There's really, a, I, I think, from the beginning, there wasn't really a clear idea of what this supposed to be. Uh, um, uh, this inv invasion, because I mean, uh, President Saleh had tried seriously several times to defeat the Houthis, and if a Yemeni cannot, with you know, let's say less than democratic means at his disposal, and less than human rights compliant condu con uh, conduction of of these uh, um, uh, operations against the Houthis prior to 2015, cannot defeat them. What do you think you're going to achieve? Uh, but I can tell you what the Iranian agenda in this in this conflict is, and that's uh, the the Iranian agenda is that the conflict doesn't stop. There has never been a better gift to the uh, regional positioning of the Iran than its regional allies getting involved in a conflict which had no clear clear outcome, was definitely from the beginning never going to produce a particular victory or better situation than before, but it continues to drain the financial, political, and military resources of its greatest regional ally. Um, as another member state in the region uh, uh, representative once mentioned to me about the Syrian conflict, these are um, uh, threats, killing other threats. If this continues for a thousand years, that would just be wonderful, right? And this is the same situation from the Iranian perspective, right? So. From their perspective, whether the Houthis win or lose, right, it's really no matter as long as the conflict continues. So uh, the wrong perception of what Iran is doing is the Iranians don't have to win. It's enough for them not to lose. That gears your strategy, that focuses the resources to certain things. They could have delivered um, air defense missiles, shoulder hold held, uh, air defense missiles, that I would have brought both the Saudi as well as the UAE Air Force into great trouble air early on in the conflict, and they just didn't, right? Because it's not about winning, or, uh, winning. it's about not losing and keeping the conflict going. Right, so then the next question was, um, Qatar and Oman, absolutely agree. Um, I would say Oman is trying uncomfortably to remain somewhat of a neutral position. They have, uh, of course, negotiation channels to the Iranians, frequently used used also by uh, the Americans, not only in the framework of the JCPOA, but also when it comes to hostage exchange situations with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Iranians. But without a doubt, when you say the borders are closed, I would say, yes, true, except the Romanian omani yemeni border, where the stuff from Iran continues to flow. They have never shipped entire missiles, except at the very beginning. They always shipped spare parts and parts which are assembled in in Yemen, which has the added benefit that you develop a domestic capability, which means over time you will have to ship less and less of those parts into Yemen, um, because you're teaching your client as the patron on how to build these things by themselves, which makes it cheaper, more effective, and um, uh, is a really elegant way to go around the embargoes over time. Pardon me? The problem is, yeah, is the question of if you look at the current dis discussion in Switzerland uh, uh, um, about its neutrality in the Ukraine conflict, you, when you are bordering a conflict, neutrality is a very complex issue, right? So if you would stop the Iranians from doing what they're doing, and I'm not saying that this is government policy, I'm just saying the, it seems to me that the policy to prevent this from happening isn't exactly as strong as it possibly could be, um, you would then lose your access to the Iranian side. So you know it's, it's a give and take. That's why you have Russian money in Switzerland not touched yet. Um, and a discussion of how far you could go, and Switzerland not supplying ammunition um, for the tanks that the Germans wanted to deliver to Ukraine. And so they had to buy it in South America. So th this. Neutrality is a complex issue. Okay, so that was that. And then there was a last 
that was the last component to your question. Number two. Oh, um, the one thing that all of these airstrikes attacks have shown, I mean, Patriot is a fantastic system. It is really fantastic if your missile flies very fast, very high. Um, it is not quite as fantastic when you have drones or low-flying, relatively slow missiles. It's fairly useless against that. That's why the Israelis have the Patriots and Iron Dome, because the Patriots help you against, for example, Iraqi Scud rockets quite effectively. They uh, uh, help you against uh, medium-range Iranian rockets quite effectively. But when, as the gas facilities have shown, I mean, the Patriot system didn't even switch on because the stuff was flying so slow and so low that the Patriot didn't even recognize as a threat, right? And so since the majority of the strikes are done by systems that are slow and low flying, you can keep the Patriots there, but you may as well use them in the Baltic region where you, you do have a developing threat from our big neighbor to the east. So it's a question of, you know, I understand the pol politics around withdrawing them, but militarily speaking, you can keep it there and, and hope that someone shoots some rocket. But when you are in a situation that the Iranians would resort to this kind of strike capabilities, you are very close to a nuclear conflict. So obviously, the Americans are trying to prevent this from happening at this point. All right. I hope I addressed all the, all the questions. Ne next question is His Excellency Ambassador Albada, please. Just a small comment, really. Yeah. Um, I believe the, the Houthis will continue to be a great uh, and essential threat to, to the region, to Kuwait and, and, and others, yeah. really, like, you know. While uh, we are really not sending the right message uh, to Iran, really, like, you know, I believe we have to judge whether the, our position is, is firmly, I, uh, you know, pragmatic or like, you know, I, uh, idealistic, yeah. or, or which way, really? Yeah. Like. We cannot deal with, with Houthis and singling out other items, other essential items. We have to connect this file with other network files, uh, uh, mainly with the GCPOA, really like, you know, mm. for example, like, you know, I have to name like, you know, while I'm here in Germany. Yeah. Like, you know, Germany is dealing with such portfolio, uh, you know, uh, in a way of, of, of their own interest as well. Okay, they have to reach the yeah. nuclear agreements, really, like, you know, and, and to see what is the outcome of, of, of that. So that's why I, I think we have to send the right message to the Houthis. You know, in Kuwait, we host the Houthis for 103 days mm. for their negotiation. Yeah. Okay, and we were about to, to settle the, the agreements, and unfortunately, other third, fourth, fifth parties, yeah. other proxies there, maybe, yeah. Uh, okay, so they recalculate their own position. Yeah. So this is my own, uh, right. like, you know. Um, full disclosure here, I'm actually a fan of the JCPOA, um, and uh, let me just paint a scenario for you here. If you th don't think we confront the Iranians um, correctly and aggressively enough now, you can rest assured we will not confront them when they have a nuclear capability. Now, what I was seeing is that I saw between 2015 and 2018 an arrest of the capability of the Iranians on their nuclear capabilities, centrifuges, stockpiles, uh, reactor. They had no uranium metal. And between 2018 till today, 60% more, latest report of the IAA, uh, uh, came out this morning, 60% more of 60% enriched uranium. They have now several kilos of uranium metal, which is the last step before you form it into an orb for an implosion device. Decades ago, they did all the tests for the, um, for the um, uh, triggers and explosives. Um, so they have all the components in the world. Now, if you remember uh, uh, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech at the UN many years ago, with the bomb and the red line. We are way beyond that red line now. So if you want to panic about the Iranians being weeks away from having a nuclear implosion device and the means to deliver via the Shahab 3, now is the time where you should start panicking. And I, I'm very sorry, uh, on, on the nuclear side, confrontation ends. There is a reason why NATO doesn't confront Russia now, and that's the nuclear threat by Russia. And that the exact same systematics um, will apply if Iran gets a nuclear capability. Then there will be mutual deterrence between, between them and Israel, 
and it will be balanced, but that means there will be limits to what can be done with Iran. So a nuclear-capable Iran means a Gulf region dominated by Iran. And I don't think that the US, at the moment, with its strategic confrontation with Russia and China at the same time, which holds the majority of the US debt, will have the political or military will to re-roll and uh, fold out a nuclear, uh, a nuclear umbrella over its Gulf neighbors as well. You will be having to deal with this. So the one or the two really strategic uh, points about the JCPOA were, one, it arrested the Iranian nuclear, uh, 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 nuclear program. There were actual numbers in there. That much centrifuges of this type, that much enriched uranium, 100% effectively as long as the JCPOA worked. Um, and it wasn't the fault of the JCPOA um, that it stopped working. And secondly, it actually quite, and this is something that apparently is not really recognized or understood, it is the first time that a massive gap and loophole in the non-proliferation treaty, the NPT, was filled. The problem with the NPT is it's a very simple deal. Those who have nuclear weapons say they would get rid of them. Obviously, that doesn't happen. And those who didn't have the absolute innate right to have nuclear energy for civilian purposes. The problem is there is absolutely no definition of what civilian purposes is. And the problem technically, and you can see I was part of the German negotiation team um, for the JCPOA. Um, the problem is the exact same technical capabilities that you need for your civilian nuclear program, so your centrifuges, your conversion, your enrichment, your uh, 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 plutonium reactors, your uh, um, uh, light water reactors, are the same capabilities you need for a nuclear weapon. There's absolutely no definition of where the line lies, apart when you put the, pe uh, the stuff together for a nuclear warhead. Now, the JCPOA, for the first time, defines what a potential civilian nuclear program looks like. Because for 70 million people, you have X amount of reactors, X amount of centrifuges, and X amount of enriched uranium. Anyone else on the globe ever thinking about a nuclear program, if the JCPA would work, uh, again, hopefully, will have to explain why they need Y more reactors, Z more centrifuges, or A more uh, enriched uranium, which means we now have a president that we can argue on, rather than having to go back to this very orderous discussion of, this is too many centrifuges, why do you need this many reactors? Um, when we are not sure whether this is a civilian or military program or both. And we had the same discussion unsuccessfully in India, in Pakistan, we have it currently in North Korea, with a very, very clear outcome. In all three cases, proliferation wasn't arrested. It, it, they all three became a nuclear weapon state with which we have to live now. So this is a good thing, the JCPOA. I understand that it's diff seen differently in the region because it means we are not confronting the Iranians on absolutely every single issue. But to quote a former US president, just because you have the best hammer in the world doesn't mean that every problem is a nail. Sometimes it is a screw. And this was a diplomatic solution to one of the pressing issues. What is also not quite understood about the JCPOA is we have the absolute ability to, to sanction Iran or the Houthis on anything else except the nuclear program. No one says, and no one has stopped sanctioning Iran on human rights abuses. The UN, uh, the EU did. While they were defending the, uh, the JCPOA, they sanctioned some Iranian IHC officers on, humanitarian, or on human rights violations, or on its support for terrorism, or on its support for the Houthis. We have the entire sanctions area open to us, except when it comes to nuclear dossier. So we cannot levy a sanction because the Iranians obtained a centrifuge if they adhere to the processes in the JCPA. Which means, even if they get the stuff and it's not according to the JCPA, we can still sanction them because of that. right? So it closed a small door, left all the other doors open, and once the JCPA stopped working, we are now weeks away from a nuclear capability. We used to be years away from a nuclear capability. I cannot see how the maximum pressure strategy in any way, shape, or form has ever worked in the last four years, in any aspect. We are much worse off, and we will have to take much greater risks and make much further concessions to get even halfway back where we used to be in 2018 
for no good reason. So if maximum pressure would be worked, we, I wouldn't be standing here and saying, now is the time to panic as a regional state. We are here in Berlin, it's really fairly comfortable away. You are a couple of minutes of flight times away from, from an Iranian nuclear bomb. This is not a good situation, right? And I, for, for purely political purposes, this was, this was basically renegated in 2018. Sorry for the long rant about this, but I, I think there's a really conceptual misunderstanding of what the JCPA was and was not supposed to do, and what it achieved and what it not achieved, because there is so much political rhetoric around it that completely ignores all the technical aspects of this. All right, thank you so much, sorry. Thank you, one final question over here. If you could please introduce yourself. Uh, Rania from the Embassy of Saudi Arabia. Yep. Um, I actually have, um, I will start with thank you uh, for your concert, concert, constructive presentation and also thanks for the, organizing this event. Um, it's not a question as much as two points, yeah. two comments. Um, one comment I would always like to, uh, in that type of gathering, to highlight on the issue of Safer, the mm -hmm. Trank Safer, uh, which um, from our perspective it's um, threat for our region, international, yeah. um, um, regional, as well um, as the second point, um, just to make it clear that it's the war since it started is not something between Saudi and any other country. It mm. just like um, Saudi wouldn't ex expect uh, accept any other country to threat um, its uh, its people, its citizens, or uh, our region. Mm. So um, thank you so much for uh, for Mr. Ibrahim when he mentioned uh, how Saudi since um, uh, since uh, decades before that um, uh, the relationship between us and Yemen is is a very strong. And uh, Saudi always um, try to help and to give uh, Yemen to improve. Uh, Merkaz, uh, the, the center of King Salman, is always help a lot. And um, maybe the people who are not in deep in uh, in, in this um, subject or in this topic, they wouldn't know what we are doing. But we're doing a lot to help Yemenis to improve Yemen. This is what we, we need. We need. Uh, for us to be secure and in peace, and we need also for for Yemen as a, as a, as a country that is a neighbor and uh, connected us um, with many uh, historical and uh, traditional and cultural um, uh, beliefs um, to be also in a secure and uh, um, we never want to see anyone in threat. So um, so nothing between Saudi and, uh, and Iran or any other country. We we respect Iran as much. They don't support uh, to for more attacks mm. uh, in, in in our country or in the region. You know, I understand um, that, thanks. and I fully agree with this. Um, I would, however, argue that on balance, this military engagement has not benefited um, the Saudi position as much as it did the, the Iranian position. That was my point, right? So uh, I'm not saying that the Iranians were right. I'm not saying that the Iranians are, I hope my presentation made clear that the Iranians are not a benign actor in the region. Um, but on balance, this has been on the plus side for Iran, and I would say nearly unmitigatedly plus side of the Iranians, unfortunately. Right. Um, so thank you very much, and also thank everybody uh, for being so civil, although I guess there's a lot of many positions uh, mm -hmm. today here, and we're talking about a violent conflict, um, so I'm even more happy um, for the way the discussion uh, goes and for the tone. And um, now we want you all, uh, want to invite you all to have a coffee and a little cookie, and uh, maybe you saw, um, saw on um, our program that uh, there will be lunch at two o'clock. So um, we, we are going to do it like the Southern Europeans today and be a little bit later with our lunch. <laughs> so. Super. Thank you.